what, you know, what are the key points coming out? So this is uh, the panel, SIF and the future of climate action. Um, so this will be a moment to take stock, not just of the two-day event. I know that all of you have been very engaged in different discussions. I had an opportunity to visit many of the breakout sessions. Really interesting discussions, both about challenges, but also about opportunities. And I must say, working more on the climate science side when I go to conferences, it's a lot of doom and gloom. That when you come to conferences such as this one, talking about renewable energy, uh, you know, the opportunities, it's a completely different atmosphere. And it's striking, I must say. But it's also to discuss SIFT's most uh, important achievements over these past 10 years. You know, some of, the, some of the experiences, learning that we can pull out of this, but of course also then focus on the uh, climate action and the role SIFT can have in the future. You know, what can we do? How can we improve the system uh, that we have to deliver even more and even faster? Uh, we have a nice panel uh, to discuss these issues with, with us. We have Honorable Al uh, Musafa Garbaf, the Minister of Environment, Urban Safety and Sustainable Development from Niger. Welcome back to the panel and applaud, I think, you know, come on, we, yes. <laughs> we have Mr. John Roon, Senior Director, Climate Change World Bank, and applaud, yes, welcome. <laughs> We have Mr. Fiu Mataese Elisara, the executive director of the Ole COCO MAGA Society Incorporated from Samoa. Welcome. <laughs> I complained the traveling here from Stockholm, you know, at the distance <laughs> and the time it took, Samoa. Hmm. I think, you know, probably a long flight. Uh, and we are also very pleased to be joined by uh, Mafalda Duarte, the uh, head of uh, CIF. Mafalda, I know we asked you to step in very late here, but we felt also that, you know, some of the comments about SIF, it would be excellent also to get your perspectives on that, and maybe some comments, direct reactions, uh, and so on. So we are pleased that you are here. So a warm applause also for Mafalda. <laughs> so you have, you know, participated in different sessions here. We have discussed the achievements of SIF over the past uh, 10 years. If we take that before we look into the future and so on, some key experiences, some messages, some uh, in particularly interesting uh, observations uh, from you first. Uh, Minister, can you start? Oh. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je voudrais tout d'abord, au nom de la délégation du Niger, qui est constituée de deux ministres et de plusieurs cadres, une bonne demi-douzaine, remercier les organisateurs de cette rencontre qui nous a donné l'opportunité de faire le bilan des dix ans d'action du CIF. Alors, qu'est-ce que nous avons retenu durant ces deux jours de discussion D'abord, la confirmation de l'urgence à agir à l'action climatique. Nous avons pris connaissance, même si nous savions déjà, des conclusions du dernier rapport du GIEC, qui a davantage secoué la sonnette d'alarme. Ce qui prouve qu'il y a dix ans, lorsque le CIF a, a été engagé dans l'action qu'elle a menée, il y avait une pertinence dans les, les besoins et l'action à, à, disons, les résultats à atteindre. À savoir qu'il y avait cette urgence de l'action climatique à agir pour la résilience des populations dans les états dans lesquels elle a le CIF donc, dans lequel il est intervenu. Euh, nous retenons, à travers euh, le rapport euh, sur euh, le tra rapport transformationnel, qui a eu quand même beaucoup de résultats en termes de transformation dans différents pays, que ce soit sur le terrain de la résilience des populations, mais aussi en termes d'instauration de, de, de bonnes pratiques dans différents domaines, euh, la gestion des ressources naturelles, en l'occurrence, la transition énergétique, entre autres. Euh, ce qui concerne euh, mon pays, le Niger, je dois relever que l'intervention du CIF à travers quatre projets a permis, dans un premier temps, d'aider à la prise en compte de la dimension changement climatique dans plusieurs politiques et 
stratégie sectorielle. Ensuite, l'action a permis de renforcer certaines bonnes pratiques, en l'occurrence en matière de gestion durable des terres et de la résilience des populations, surtout dans le secteur de l'agriculture. Ce sont des résultats très et encourageant. Euh, maintenant, euh, il faut encourager le CIF, je pense qu'il doit rester dans l'architecture du financement du climat mondial en renforçant euh, sa participation au financement de l'action climatique dans plusieurs pays, en élargissant si possible son champ d'action, sinon à davantage de pays, mais au moins dans les pays dans lesquels il est intervenu, mais surtout en passant à l'échelle, à une échelle plus importante, en le développant, en développant donc les résultats à terme. Donc, dans un premier temps, je pense que ce sont les premières impressions que je peux exprimer. If I can just follow up on a question with you, sir. Um, you, you mentioned that there was partly success in, in, the, in, in, the, in the fact that they have man you have managed to get climate into various strategies. You, you also mentioned resilience, for instance, in agriculture, that that came in as an important factor also in your strategy. Um, how did that actually happen? What was the driver behind the success of getting these broader perspectives into, for instance, agriculture, bringing in that factor of resilience, for instance, uh, in your strategies? How did it happen? Alors, bon, c'est un, d'abord c'est un mouvement, il faut le reconnaître, qui est, qui est mondial. Euh, lorsque, il y a quelques années, surtout après le sommet de Rio, euh, la question climatique avait commencé à, à, être, à être secouée pour alarmer un peu la communauté mondiale et surtout africaine sur les dangers euh, que courait la planète en ce qui concerne la, le réchauffement climatique. Très peu de leaders croyaient en la réalité donc, euh, de ces risques-là. Alors, grâce à l'action de, il faut le connaître, de plusieurs partenaires, le CIF y a contribué, et, mais pas exclusivement, mmh. bien entendu. Le programme stratégique de résilience climatique a mené plusieurs actions qui ont concerné à la fois le renforcement des capacités des différents acteurs au niveau national et assurant ainsi une meilleure compréhension à travers différentes études, une meilleure compréhension de euh, comment est-ce que les changements climatiques impactent le développement, comment les changements climatiques impactent euh, mmh. la vie des, des populations à travers leur action quotidienne, qui est, euh, comme je l'avais dit euh, dans ma, ma déclaration d'hier, euh, une population qui est essentiellement rurale et pauvre. Et les actions qui ont été menées sur le terrain, qui sont démonstratives, ont prouvé qu'il euh, y a une réelle appropriation par ces populations de ces questions donc de changement climatique en lien avec leur mode de vie et en lien avec leur système de production. Et les ressources naturelles, comment les gérer, comment rendre plus résilients par rapport à leurs besoins. Et c'est en ça que euh, je pense qu'il y a eu euh, une contribution positive donc, du CIF euh, à la résilience des populations. Maintenant, l'intégration euh, de, de, de la donne climatique dans les différentes politiques et stratégies, ça c'est déjà une volonté donc euh, euh, disons des autorités nationales qui exprimaient ailleurs dans l'agenda climatique mmh. mais qui a eu l'appui et le soutien donc de, des projets financés par le CIF pour transformer ces actions en, euh, dans le sens de leur prise en compte dans nos politiques et stratégies et pas toutes, mais certaines dans le domaine des transports, en l'occurrence, de l'énergie, de, de l'agriculture. Et ça, c'est des avancées très significatives dans le sens de l'appropriation de la problématique du climat dans nos stratégies et politiques de développement de façon globale. Thank you. So again, it's, it's sort of going back to uh, the success of integration working 
much broader than just focusing on climate, but also working from the people's level, but all the way up also to policy. Interesting, uh, John, maybe I can move to you in, in this regard. I know this is also a factor that you stress. You have a long experience from the World Bank. You have now also the experience of 10 years of CIF. Uh, what would you say have been the success factors that we really need to keep track on also when we move forward of, of CIF and, and of course maybe of the broader architect, ar architecture? <coughs> Very good, thank you and good afternoon everyone. Um, I think there are three things that strike me about mm. CIF. First of all, the transformational impact that they've been able to have. Sorry, let me remove this. Yeah. It's <laughs> echoing when you leave the headphones on. Um, first of all, the transformational impact that CIF has been able to have on people's lives. Secondly, its continuing relevance. And third, the community that it has created. So on the transformational impact, $55 billion mobilized is not small change in anybody's uh, language. But beyond that, CIF has been able to create markets, wind market in Mexico, CSP here in Morocco. It's not so much that you've got a wonderful power plant here in Morocco, it's that this stimulated the development of CSP elsewhere. Hmm. Small and medium enterprises in Turkey, first mover in a lot of technologies, geothermal, lots of different countries. So creating markets that allowed things to develop that wouldn't have happened before. Secondly, systemic change, particularly on the adaptation and resilience. Of Niger, a fantastic example of where this was built into the main strategies and sectoral policies of Niger. But it's not just Niger alone. Mozambique, Tajikistan, Zambia, we heard lots of these examples. And this is exactly what's needed going forward. Third, it's a climate investment fund but many of the benefits are not mm. just climate. You get increased agricultural in income. You've got reduced air pollution. You've got cheaper energy bills because of energy efficiency. The benefits are much broader than just climate. But it has also impacted individual people's lives. We've heard the stories from a number of speakers out here. Mm. It's very moving just to wander through and look at the pictures in the lobby here. These are real people we're talking about. Each one has a mother, a father, they've probably got kids, they've got livelihoods, they've got aspirations. We're not talking about abstract things here. These are really people's lives mm. that they impact. And in the form of transformation, I think CIF has modeled the way on social inclusion. So you think about the DGM, working with indigenous peoples, empowering indigenous peoples, and the gender aspects of what CIF did. CIF set a very high bar to ensure that its investments were gender sensitive. But then that, frankly, even from the World Bank's perspective, we took that learning to shape our entire gender and climate program within the World Bank. So mm. it's been transformative, number one. Number two, relevant. You can do transformation, but is it relevant? Mm. If you think back to what we heard about what we need to adjust to 1.5 degree world, <coughs> the speed with which we need to, to move, and the significant transformation this is not business as usual we're talking about. And I think what CIF has illustrated is an ability to do the kinds of things that we only need more of in the future. Mm. We don't need bread and butter investments. We need this kind of transformation at scale and at speed, and CIF has proved they're gonna do that. And so I think they're a model for the kinds of more that we need in the future. So that continued relevance. And the third one is community. You know, I just look out here, I see ministers. I see MDBs, I see technical experts, I see donors, okay, I see community members. A community has been created of dedicated professionals driving the sport, the smoothness of the running of the event. Every time we talk about something that happens in Niger because of SIF, it's not just the 35 people in SIF, it's not just the MDB task team leaders, it's not just the minister, it's not just the community. It's bringing that community mm. together in a way that delivers as a whole, but it's also a community that celebrates each other's success. I've heard these, these stories that have become almost legend now of one country celebrating the success that another country had by getting their program uh, approved and saying, well, what did you do that was interesting that I can learn from? Mm. But in that learning, to be quite candid about what is not yet working well 
and stretching the bar even further. Okay, we've done well now, that's good, but let's not get complacent. Let's think about what more we can do. How can we do things better? And so I think creating that learning, adaptive, committed community is fundamentally what gives me a lot of hope for this. Because we can always do a bit of technical stuff here, a bit of technical stuff there. But it's the people that underpin it that will drive it forward into the future, that will carry the lessons. Mm. So that's what I take out. I mean, and this is fascinating because what, you, what you're saying is somehow reflecting a learning organization. Because yeah. I, I understand that when you started 10 years ago, maybe this was not exactly the case. I mean, it, there is a learning curve. And what have, what have been the cr uh, critical success, success factors for that learning to happen within an, uh, a structure like SIF, but also a structure like the World Bank then, because SIF operates within the World Bank. So what, is the, what are the success factors to actually get where we are today uh, for a mechanism such as this one? So I think there are a few factors. So one is, I think that to be clear, and to understand from the analytics that we're doing that we don't have all the answers. Mm. And so in order to achieve our objectives, we have to be a learning organization. Okay, we did not know how to construct a concentrated solar plant in Morocco. But if we're gonna do it, we have to learn. So a core part of the objective is to build that learning into um, the process. Second thing is to create an environment where people are willing and able to take risks. But that just doesn't come from nowhere. So I think that there's a lot of credit due to the trust fund committee to be willing to approve things that would take a certain degree of risk, okay? Not everybody believed in this CSP project in Morocco when it started. It was too expensive, there was too much concessional finance in it, can it really be done? But the trust fund committee was willing to take a mm. risk, okay. okay? And then people were willing to put resource behind it. You don't just learn from nothing. If you have a look at the budget of the SIP, there is money in there to do the evaluations. All of the stuff that you heard about today took money and resources to make it happen. And investing in that learning, I think, allowed it to drive forward. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Risk is a clear factor here, but having also all stakeholders, all the different actors on board to really be able to push things forward and also support uh, the learning of the organization. Uh, few, could you also say maybe a few words about the organization you represent uh, out of curiosity? Um, and then of course also some, some uh, of the learning that you think you would like to share in terms of SIF and the su success factors that we have seen, please. Thank you. Let, uh, let me first uh, thank the uh, government of Morocco for the uh, hospitality that we've uh, enjoyed in the last uh, few days. And indeed, thank you, uh, Mafalda and uh, SIF, for actually inviting me. You know, I have actually traveled 45 hours yeah. of flying <laughs> just so, to get here. So the you know, I need to, than the to justify my <laughs> being here. <laughs> but my organization is... Uh, <clears throat> dealing with sustainable development uh, agenda, and mm. we're pursuing uh, those areas and being become a, an advocate of uh, the issues that are affecting local communities and indeed indig indigenous peoples and developing countries. Uh, but in terms of what we're here for in, of, on this closing ceremony, um, in the last couple of days, I think all you need to do is look around, as uh, John was just saying. You know, This is a reflection of what SIF is about. The enormity of the experiences here, the, the technical quality that are here, the people from the communities, indigenous peoples, and even uh, all the sessions in the last uh, couple of days speak volumes in terms of what SIF is all about. And for me, um, in, in the context of climate change, an existential uh, threat to us, more particularly from where I come from, a small island development state, and of course, representing uh, local communities, indigenous peoples. We are perhaps more at the forefront of climate change. Uh, and uh, we get uh, frustrated looking from the outside in mm. terms of the global dialogue now, uh, uh, in our view, has uh, sort of retreated you know, in a lot of ways in terms of climate justice uh, arguments that we have. But for SIF, that has become a, a, a real uh, element of hope for us. It's really the light of hope that uh, is, is, is giving us a lot of, of encouragement. And we, if I may say that uh, SIF is like a doctor that actually generates hope for us uh, in terms of the climate change mm. issue. Uh, but having said that, uh, having sort of listened to the presentations around, uh, 
the thing that really comes to, to my mind in terms of what I'm hearing at the corridor, at the sessions, is that it's really the whole question of leadership mm. on climate finance. With small staff, $8.3 billion, more than 70 countries, more than 300 projects, a delivery of 93% already in implementation phase. That's speak volumes. And at the cloud of the, what do you call it? Uh, sunset clause or whatever that is. You know, you have spent about 30% of your time the last 10 years worrying about that. But even at that, you continue to do the work. You continue to have faith in the process. And I hope that there are some positive signs of uh, the future of SIF as we move forward in terms of, of, of what that is all about. But the leadership, you know, in terms of at the global level, first of all, and I, of course at the country level where we, where we sit. But from the global level, having benefited as one of the observers uh, in, in, the, in SIF, we, we greatly appreciate the fact that SIF has actually paved the way for other climate financing to learn from them, you know, the, the, the climate models that they are presenting. I mean, GF has learned in terms of its own governance about stakeholder engagement in the governance level. They have learned from them. Uh, unfortunately, we, you know, in terms of where I sit and uh, the uh, perception of the of SIF and the way that they have uh, created a lot of the of the uh, structures and what have you. And we were hoping that GCF will uh, basically take that and, uh, and hit the ground running. And unfortunately, uh, that has not been the case. Uh, even, even the issues of, uh, of uh, climate financing, uh, and more particularly because MDBs are the face of SIF at the country level. And uh, you have really created a wonderful atmosphere of actually getting them to work together. Even at uh, the country level that we have heard that political oppositions have been able to come together and talk very, uh, very, uh, you know, collaboratively because of the fact that uh, your transformational change and your programming approach have actually forced many of our own countries to actually engage and to talk to one another. It's not about a guarding turf. In the past, uh, you have spoken very adequately and eloquently about transferring some of this pessimistic <laughs> narrative into very powerful and positive examples of climate, you know, uh, benefits at the country level and at, even at the global level. Uh, so these are some of the messages I'm hearing and uh, very, very positive about it. Uh, and forgive me uh, for saying this, but if I may, uh, I guess because climate is an investment fund, so we've spent the last couple of weeks very much uh, focusing on investment side on the economic uh, side and the benefits that have been generated. Mm. There has been, in my view, as, as where I sit as a, as a person from uh, the civil society and indigenous peoples, we needed to have some balance on the issues of how that economic uh, benefits are actually impacting on the lives of our people, on the limited and finite resources that the economic uh, you know, uh, aspirations actually uh, 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 depend upon. But, the creation of the SAN, you know, the, the, uh, the stakeholder engagement uh, network, it's, it's very innovative, but uh, it's something that we, you have created, and of course, we hope that the other climate finances will actually uh, uh, buy into and become owners of that very initiative, because a lot of us go to different climate finances. And we need to have a common messages, uh, but uh, to actually promote uh, different messages uh, can often be, uh, you know, not at our at our advantage. But from where we sit at the country level, one of the biggest, as I've said, is for the first time, we have been asked and engaged by the governments in their own national processes. I mean, they, there has been a lot of the rhetoric about yes, we have uh, consulted, we have done consultations, but some of those consultations don't really follow meaningful consultation that it should. Uh, that so you I would say that the work process has actually changed thanks to uh, the, the sort of requirements that SIF has actually in terms of stakeholder engagement and so on? I think the, the, it was not top down sort of uh, you have to do this, but at least it has actually generated mm. and been very catalytic 
in the leadership at the country level as well to actually integrate and to come together on an integrated approach, multi-sectoral uh, uh, approach, uh, you know, engaging everyone, actually uh, in terms of our own community and indigenous people's engagement, you have been invited to be part of the, uh, mm. of the, of the dialogue at the country level. Thank you very much. And after a sunset clause, always a sunrise clause will come, we hope. That's, you know, why we are here now. Um, Mafalda, Thank you. clearly, I mean, it's maybe difficult to add something here. If you think the three panelists have missed something, I think this has been a, you know, really a very strong message that CIF has played a very instrumental role, not just providing resources, but actually changing the structures and also challenging a little bit uh, the architecture in terms of uh, being more approachable, you could say, working more coordinated, being less fragmented, but also that, that you know, having a broader perspective in terms of development and working with people from the, from the top and the bottom. Something you would like to add, but also what I would like to, you know, I'm a bit curious about, because you worked with SIF, as you said, from the start. What have you found to be the most challenging over the past 10 years, but where you have been successful? So, you know, a challenge that you really found, this has been so difficult, but I have really succeeded, or we have succeeded as a, as a team, as SIF, please. Yes, indeed, uh, Johan, you're right. Uh, a lot has been said, um, um, and so there's not a lot to add for me. Maybe I add uh, my own personal perspective. Um, the reason why I have stayed for this long, trying to, as I said uh, yesterday, trying to drive climate action with SIF support is because from the very early start, I realized the power of the mechanism. First of all, I was very committed and it's my drive, my motivation to work on driving climate action. Um, and from the very early stage, you know, I, I found it, its business model to be very powerful. And I, I, I saw how it before. Um, and so, you know, I, I had the experience of working within government and I had the experience of working within two multilateral development banks. And what I was seeing is that we were doing things differently. And they had the potential to be a lot more meaningful and transformational. Um, so there were a couple of things that, you know, a few things that, that have been said. And that's why I, I spoke quite passionately yesterday about the business model and the five elements of this business model. You know, what we are talking about here is not easy. No. This is not easy. Um, you know, insisting on processes that are um, inclusive, that, you know, that are about putting the countries in, in, in the real driving seat, empowering the champions, and ensuring that, you know, it is a requirement that there's a process that the MDBs come together in support of, of the government, that we are inclusive in bringing the civil society and the private sector. This, these are not easy processes. Mm. And, and this take, was and business unusual yeah. mm. and takes time. So this is not going to be, so when we want an investment plan through such a process, this is going to take a lot longer than if it was done very quickly by one institution. But we, what we have realized pretty quickly is that, that the process in itself generated important ownership, engagement, and results in itself. I mean, Phil was saying, you know, for the first time, civil society organizations were being engaged, were being part of the process. Governments were listening to them and taking into account their views and what their sense of priorities. Um, you know, collaboration amongst MDBs. This, you know, this platform actually in this architecture is quite unique. We don't have it. We don't have it. You know, we, the requirement is multilateral development banks working together and bringing the best that they can offer to a specific country in a coordinated manner and bringing along their expertise and bringing along their resources. And so, you know, I, my message is, you know, it, it, this is quite unique. And I speak from firsthand experience. This is quite unique and very powerful because, you know, the results are visible. Mm. So, so the question to me is, you know, as, as has been discussed as well, 
how can we even think in a context where we have this climate urgency, where we have a very narrow window of opportunity, and there's this urgency of scale and speed of actually not considering maximizing the power of the mechanism. You know, so to me, I think this is, this is really important. The key question, yeah. Um, this is a really important uh, point. So, but you, you were asking, and I have to say one thing as well, I think John mentioned it, is the importance of this governance structure we have, these trust fund committees, mm. because they kept us, the MDBs, everyone accountable to you know, what the strategic goals were and how we were going about meeting those strategic goals. Mm. Um, so all of the members, the donor countries and the recipient countries and the civil society organizations representing in, these, in this governance structure played a key role. Because we debated, you know, I remember several discussions about, okay, how, how, you know, explain, how can we be hopeful that this will bring about the transformation we want? What's the theory of change? Explain it. Go back, articulate better. <laughs> and so, you know, this governance structure uh, played uh, an important role as well. Hmm. Now, you talked about what was the the difficulty. Well, the most biggest <laughs> challenge, the hurdle that you have actually overcome. I mean, maybe this was the case. The, the very you know, tough demands on you that you have to explain and really show and make a case for this broader, more integrated perspective. But otherwise, it was just something else that you are particularly proud of, you could say. You I'm know, this proud of so many things. Yeah, but if you choose one. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, as I said, you, you know, um, I, I commend everybody for for really being so committed to uh, to making, you know, to generating the results that, that we have achieved. Because as I said, we could have chosen alternative ways which were simple yes. and in many people's mind are more efficient because it, they took less time, they costed less, but we didn't decide to go that way. Mm. We really decided to go the way of let us really test a new model and see how impactful it can be. Perfect. I think that is a good answer. I mean, that is tough to overcome, such a hurdle. We have to go for something that initially may look more complex, more expensive, but the gains will be larger. Let us now sit back and think that we are actually in 2030. Okay? You know, it's only 11 years from now. We, we tend to talk about the future. Um, there was an American baseball player who said the future is not what it used to be. Um, <laughs> That's one aspect. Uh, Niels Bohr said the predictions are difficult, especially about the future. So, you know, you can, you know, the future is something over there. But we talk about 2030, we talk about 2050 a lot. 2030 is around the corner. We are saying we have these numbers and they come up all the time. 140 to 175 billion US dollars need to be invested annually at that time. Uh, we hear about thousands of billions of dollars that need to be invested in infrastructure, more than the current stock. Huge numbers. 2030. So, 10 years from now, 5th 20 years anniversary. That's what we are celebrating. That's why we are sitting here, 2030, and celebrating this. Because there was a bit of a lack there. So that, it became 2030. Um, <laughs> what has been the success factor? What have we changed in terms of how we operate, the architecture? What are the success factors that will actually make it possible to reach the targets that we are setting for, setting for 2030? You know, really bending the curves of carbon dioxide, really investing in climate adaptation. Few, if I can turn to you first on this question, because you are coming from a small island state. Um, the urgency that you feel is clear. Um, it was clearly also uh, expressed at the Paris meeting, no, no doubt. One of the reasons we have the 1.5 report is, of course, of the SIDS uh, really pushing for this, saying that we cannot accept two degrees. Uh, it's an existential question. So 2030, what would you see as the key success factors to really take us to this scale of investments that also would, of course, help your country? Think, I think from uh, the SIF perspective, uh, are you going to be existing by then? <laughs> Yes, that's, that's rule number one, they, you know. <laughs> we hope you do, because they have justified the, you know, the existence. The fact that, uh, you know, the donors have, have actually reduced their climate change portfolio by 37%. Uh, they have uh, given, what, GCF, 
in 2015, something like $33 billion, uh, and in 2016, $38 billion, compared with uh, the $100 billion that per year that was uh, uh, promised. And I think in 2010, uh, John, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, I, I think I read a report of the World Bank that says that adaptation alone you need $600 billion. No, exactly. Mitigation alone you need $600 billion. And technology transfer, you need $500 billion. So, I mean, the enormity of the problem versus the, uh, the, uh, the resources that can be mobilized to address that is, is immense. And therefore, uh, as we move forward, uh, the question of promises versus uh, the reality is, is, uh, is really important. I mean, climate investment funds is an investment, so, you know, funding is so important. And if it's uh, not only what we've said, but predictable, uh, uh, additional, and flexible, um, these are the kinds of things that we need to actually have some accountability on in terms of the, what has been promised on the climate, uh, climate portfolio. But uh, from, from where we sit, uh, you know, if, if I can use, I think many of you have heard uh, the story on, uh, on what an investigative uh, uh, journalism is. Uh, that uh, you really need to put your finger on a problem, but be very careful that you don't put your finger in somebody's eye. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> where we sit is we've been very frustrated. Yes. And uh, we, you know, despite the fact that we don't want to put our finger in somebody's eye, we always have that tendency. But, you know, the fact that SIF has actually uh, created some uh, confidence mm. in us to actually do otherwise, <laughs> uh, you know, it's certainly something that we, we look forward to in terms of going forward. But for SIF, you know, you have really now set up a whole plethora of experiences, of expertise. Uh, how can we actually now move forward and actually facilitate the sharing of those? Yeah. You know, uh, find a way of actually do a north-south, uh, you know, transfer of uh, technical assistance, uh, technical know-how, uh, the, the advisory capacity, and indeed the south-south uh, transfer of knowledge. And I'm really happy because, you know, right now there's uh, the fact that uh, CIA, uh, CIF has the guts and, uh, you know, the boldness to actually get itself to be evaluated uh, and then be able to have that as a basis to, to self-direct uh, uh, its course mm. is, is very positive. And the fact that there is ongoing program on, on learning uh, the experiences, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, and we hope that uh, some of the, the programs that have already been approved but with no funding as we move forward can be funded. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, those are the kind of things that we, we would like to see as we move forward. But certainly in terms of the 2030, uh, where's the money? That's the simple question. <laughs> Minister Garba. Um, I mean, you also face huge challenges. We talked uh, before also in the previous panel about the fact that it's bo both about mitigation but also adaptation, and you, you mentioned also resilient agriculture and so on. So 2030, scaling up of finance, really making sure that we reach the targets we are setting. Where do you see the success factors for this, and how do you see that international climate finance and the structure can actually deliver uh, those results? Alors, je suis d'accord avec vous que 2030, c'est déjà demain dans l'agenda climatique. Even for politicians. <laughs> pour tout le monde. <laughs> Alors, euh, il faut déjà relever que le dernier rapport euh, donc, du groupe intergouvernemental sur le climat nous a révélé déjà que même si nous mettions en œuvre tous les engagements pris à l'occasion de l'accord de Paris, nous ne sommes pas sur la trajectoire de la réduction de 2 degrés à l'horizon 2030. Et je crois qu'on se prépare probablement à la prochaine conférence des partis à demander aux partis de rehausser les ambitions. Donc de revoir à la hausse leurs ambitions. Ce qui signifie encore plus de financement. Or, comme je l'ai dit, d'une part, euh, les États africains euh, pensent qu'il y a encore des questions qui n'ont pas été correctement réglées. Leurs préoccupations n'ont pas été suffisamment prises en compte en l'état actuel 
à l'accord de Paris, notamment la question sur l'équilibre entre l'adaptation et l'atténuation. Même s'il si, faut le reconnaître, le, le, il y a de plus en plus de consensus sur la question. Mais il y a encore euh, des États, des pays développés qui ne sont pas encore tout à fait d'accord avec ça. Alors, ça va demander beaucoup de moyens. Je vous ai révélé que dans le cadre de la commission climat pour la région du Sahel, qui est constituée de 18 pays, l'évaluation du coût de mise en œuvre des CDN à l'état actuel nous demanderait à l'horizon 2030 près de 400 milliards de dollars. Chiffre qui est complètement donc au-delà de la possibilité de financement des États. Et de très loin, euh, inférieur à ce qui est attendu de la, de, des pays développés, même si leur, les, les engagements pris à l'occasion de l'accord de Paris étaient respectés. Donc on demande, on, on a pris déjà beaucoup d'engagements. Alors, euh, et c'est pourquoi euh, je l'ai mentionné, et il faut s'en féliciter, l'Afrique a de plus en plus compris la nécessité, d'une part, de parler d'une seule voix pour faire valoir cette oui. nécessité, d'abord de prise en compte de, 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 de la nécessité de rehausser l'ambition en matière d'adaptation, de, 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 mais également les ambitions des États développés en termes d'efforts de participation au financement. Mmh. Et à cet égard, je révèle que la Commission climat pour la région du Sahel, que le Niger préside, a élaboré un plan d'investissement climatique pour la région du Sahel qui va être adopté le 25 février, donc dans moins d'un mois, par les chefs d'État et proposé à, euh, un sommet de, euh, à une table ronde de financement euh, le 26 février, table ronde à laquelle certains partenaires ici présents sont invités. Donc, il y aura besoin de beaucoup d'investissements. Et nous pensons qu'il y a lieu d'abord de, de régler certaines questions, notamment les questions de transparence. Du rossement de l'ambition, oui, mais à tous les niveaux. Les ambitions des pays vulnérables, des pays euh, en développement que nous sommes, en termes d'atténuation, oui, d'accord, mais en, en prenant en compte nos réels besoins en matière d'adaptation. Mais le rehaussement de l'ambition des pays développés également, qui sont, il faut le dire, à l'origine du réchauffement climatique, c'est eux qui émettent les gaz à effet de serre, a rehaussé le niveau de leur contribution au financement de l'action climatique. Mais en plus de cela, il faut forcément restructurer l'architecture du financement climatique actuel. Il ne faut pas parler en termes de de compétition, ce n'est pas une compétition entre les organisations, c'est beaucoup plus de réorganisation pour les rendre beaucoup plus efficaces et complémentaires. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons démontré que le CIF, euh, qui est quand même là, qui a démontré euh, une capacité d'action et de résultats, ça existe. Euh, certains fonds sont, pour le moment, en balbutiement. Des questions restent encore à régler quand on ne sait pas. Alors, c'est comme si aujourd'hui, on nous dit, voilà, il y a un malade qui est là, qui a un médecin au cheveu de lui, qui l'aide quand même à se porter mieux et à avoir le moral. Et on lui dit, bon, attendez, il y a un meilleur médecin qui est formé à la meilleure école, qui a plus de moyens, qui va venir abandonner. Mais non. On veut bien, mais en attendant, on a ce médecin qui est là, qui nous soigne, qui nous aide à nous porter mieux. On va le garder jusqu'à ce qu'on ait un meilleur médecin. Je pense que c'est comme ça qu'on doit raisonner. On ne doit pas jeter ce qui marche. On n'abandonne ne, on ne, on ne, on ne, on ne, pas une équipe qui gagne. Donc, restructuration de l'architecture du financement climatique mondial, plus de transparence et, euh, et de, 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 de... Quand je parle de transparence, c'est pour rendre beaucoup plus accessible et, euh, comment dirais-je, traçable le, 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 les ressources et des autres instruments qui existent tels que le Fonds vert pour le climat pour le moment je pense qu'il y, y, y a quelques mois euh, les pays africains ont fait l'évaluation de l'intervention du Fonds vert pour le climat à Bamako et tout le monde a dit on ne comprend rien on ne sait pas comment ça marche on ne sait pas comment accéder à ces fonds donc il y a encore quelle que soit la volonté que les gens ont de, 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 de de, de faire fonctionner le fonds vert. Pour le moment, il y a encore des questions à régler. Eh bien, faisons en sorte que ça marche, mais pour le moment, 
Gardons ce qui marche bien. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, there were a couple of quite, you know, clear messages there. Let's keep what is working. Uh, let's make sure that we don't always ask for a more complicated doctor. Was that the case? Or, <laughs> you know, someone else when we have the resources there. Um, uh, transformation, uh, uh, transparency, so, so, uh, sorry. And, you know, try to get rid of competition. This is, of course, the case now when we have more and more organizations. You are in the middle of all this in the World Bank, of course. I mean, you have all these different connections and you have the understanding of the system. So when you look ahead 10 years, uh, what is it that you see as, as critical points here? I mean, apart from what the minister uh, is raising. Reid, thank you. So I think both of the two previous speakers yeah. made some very good points. I'm going to try not to repeat them, but have a slightly different take or, or approach it from a slightly different angle. What does the world need to look like in 2030 or 2035 if we're going to deliver on what we need? Mm. We're going to need countries in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, where ministers of finance and planning are overseeing budgets that are allocating money for health, education, agriculture, water, that fully take into account the climate change and resilience that we're mm. seeing that these programs are well-funded with significant amounts of money in them, and they're based on integrated strategies that take a city-wide view or a landscapes-wide view. Take parts of the Sahel, okay? You need the agriculture, the water, the security, all of this stuff coming together in a way that allows this to move forward. That's where we need to get to. Mm. On the mitigation side, we're going to need to see the deployment of a whole bunch of new technologies, battery storage. We're going to need to see microgrids all over Africa, parts of Indonesia, that allow both energy access on a 24-hour basis, powered by renewable sources, with batteries to make it happen. Mm. That market has to be developed. We're going to need cooling solutions so that the need to bring cooling and air conditioning is not going to blow our carbon budget. We're going to need to start seeing in more emerging economies a much greater share of electric vehicles. These things, I believe, that by that point in time could be commercially viable, and we could be having this funded through purely commercial mm. means. We could crowd in the trillions of dollars that are sitting on the sides, earning low or negative rates of interest, and being used for productive purposes. But neither of these two things are going to happen automatically. No. We have to keep putting the right policies in place, the right technical assistance, and the right financing. And some of that can come from the MDBs. As I talked about earlier, as MDBs, we've made large commitments to put money behind it. But let's be frank. For all the MDB money and for all the leveraging of the private sector financing we're talking about, and for all of the mainstreaming and increased repurposing of government budgets, we need a significant chunk of concessional finance money in order to make this happen, and certainly to make it happen in the speed that we're talking about. Mm. Yes, batteries will develop, but do we want scalable batteries in five years' time or in 25 years' time? Exactly. If we could use that concessional finance, we can, con we can accelerate this discussion. I'm sure there's many ministers here who've had to deal with these decisions. They've got to pass budgets. They've got to deal with their clients. And if you're looking with a technology that's currently more expensive than the alternative, extremely difficult to move, extremely difficult to prove the case. If you have enough concessional finance to push it over the edge, you can make this happen much quicker. You can drive down the cost curves. You can make it happen. You can integrate things into government budgets. You can get your colleague in, in education or health or agriculture to do things they would not otherwise And make. how do we get that concessional money? Okay. What is the So we've barrier? got to mobilize that money. But it, it can't just be an ask. No. Okay? It has to say part of that quid pro quo has got to be that that concessional finance is going to be used in a very targeted way. Mm. Not just, well, oh, I'm doing something for climate, therefore I need concessional finance. But this is just the amount of money that I need in order to make it viable. And there has to be a quid pro quo, quid pro quo deal with the donors that this is where this is going to happen. Second thing is that money 
is going to have to be made available in a low transaction cost predictable mm -hmm. way that actually utilizes the mechanisms that we have in place for the MDBs. And this is what happens from, from the SIF. This is what we have from the SIF. I'd like to pick up a point that the minister made. In order to deliver everything that we've talked about, there is no one silver bullet of finance. No. Okay, you can't, it's not just the MDBs, it's not just the Green Climate Fund, it's not just the SIFs, it's not just pension funds, it's not just commercial banks. We have to put that whole architecture together in order to make the whole puzzle work. Each one has their complementary roles and responsibilities. There are ways of putting this stuff together. So these arguments over, can the private sector do it alone? It's all about the $100 billion. It's only the Green Climate Fund. It's only this. This is, this is not the way the world no. operates. The key issue is how do we make all of the bits and pieces come together to dr deliver on that? And, and, what's, that? and success factors for that. I mean, as you say, it happens. And we have seen it happen. Also, we talked about some cases over these uh, uh, two days. What are the sort of critical success factors there? If I had a simple answer, <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> but let me outline a, a few pieces. Yeah. So one is, I think there needs to be a clear understanding of why this is important and what does it take to make transformational change? Mm. And here there's a huge contribution from the SIFs. I, as I spoke with Mafalda and the team, all of this learning and evaluation work, if it's only for the SIFs, it's not relevant. It's really relevant because it tells us a lot about getting this action. So we need to understand the mechanisms and how this works, and it has to be owned and understood in people's minds so they understand it. That's number one. Okay, number two, we then need a bunch of uh, politicians and senior bureaucrats to make courageous decisions. Uh, uh, Gitte, uh, Greta Thunberg, this 15-year-old from, from Sweden, said it right. Okay? You can't just lament climate change. You've got to be able to take some bold decisions. And I think we're going to need, over the next, it's easy for me to say, we're going to need some people to stand up and say, we're going to make some bold commitments in order to address these issues. Mm. We're going to have to drive this. Um, and then we're just going to, some of it we're just going to have to, we can't just keep focusing on the future. We're going to have to find some concrete, I've talked about what things look like 2030, but if we only think about 2030, it's too far out. Yeah. We have to translate that into what are we going to do 2019, 2020, 2022, and build the confidence. So what I would argue is we should ensure that we can get enough concessional finance to drive this transformation, focus on three or four transformative areas, those countries that are ready to move, demonstrate what can happen, build confidence in terms of what's happening, and you then get on an upward spiral rather than a downward spiral. Yeah, so it's really um, a process, backcasting and then you're basically... Yes, and, yes. and then driving it. I would also, just in closing, what I'd like to do is, you know, there are some politicians who are much more articulate than I am about what this opportunity is, and some of my colleagues know that I, I quote some of these people a lot of times. We've talked a lot about... Mozambique here. And I like to quote Samora Michelle. Samora Michelle said, a luta continua. Okay, that means the struggle continues. This was the catchphrase of Ferlimo in the Liberation War. Okay, so everybody thinks the struggle, yes, there's a struggle and it continues. But there's more to that quote. The second part of the quote basically goes in English, victory is assured. So it's not a luta continua, woe is me, it's terrible. A luta continua, we're in there, and we're going to win, okay? And I think this is an attitude that we need to adopt, and we need to keep pushing, okay? The second person I love to quote, and this is my water bottle, okay, it has some writing on it. Okay, it's good because it's not plastic, but it has a whole bunch of Nelson Mandela quotes, okay? And I think that these are really telling. So the first one is, it always seems impossible until it's done. Okay, that's part of the history of the SIFs, and it's part of the future of the SIFs, okay? The second one says, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. <laughs> Again, we've climbed a lot of hills. There's a lot more that are coming. Third one is, there is no passion to be found in playing small, in settling for a life less than what you're capable of living. We have to think big in terms of how I'm to go. And then... In case I'm making this all sound very easy, the last one is the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling,
but in rising every time we fall. And so I think that we can clearly look, we can clearly look to these two African leaders for what the messages are going forward. Mm. And this, I, th I think, okay, we can talk about the technicalities of it. You can argue, all of this is important. All the technocratic stuff is important. But either we're gonna put the political will behind this to address it, or we're not. Excellent. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for that. Time is running. We have looked at the achievements of the past. We have looked at some of the barriers, but possibilities for the future, what we need to overcome jointly, together, working together. My father, I ask you to deliver the closing remarks directly after these wonderful quotes from Nelson Mandela. That's a tough task, <laughs> uh, of course. I know, you just made it impossible. I know, but please, take the floor, my father. We stay here. Very good. Here we are after two days of celebrating the 10th anniversary of CIF. Again, uh, ministers, honorable ministers, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there's many people here that I don't know. Um, so colleagues and friends, there's many friends here. That's the advantage of working in something for 10 years. You collect a lot of, uh, you, you gather a lot of friends, you make a lot of friends, and that um, social capital is critical. So we have, uh, we've had a, a, a busy couple of days, um, and I'm going to make it very short. Oh, thank you. Very brief, uh, because I think uh, we deserve now some reflection time or enjoyment time outside of the, the conference. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep it very, very brief. Um, I know we've had many discussions, I think around 30 discussions. Um, on what we thought when we were organizing these events as the biggest questions or at least a very comprehensive representation of the biggest questions relevant to climate action. So we've, we've talked about very much about climate, climate justice, which is very important. How do we ensure climate justice or just transitions? How do we go about uh, ensuring um, we close the gap on energy access for all. How do we really empower women? Uh, because they are powerful agents of change. They will be critical in making this climate goals happen. How do we respond to some of the biggest emerging opportunities, including building climate smart cities, we know we have a big challenge in this area, or sustainable transport networks. There were dedicated sessions today on this. We've talked about, we've tried to spark your um, enthusiasm, ideas, creativity, um, by talking about the future of climate action and new zones of opportunities, how to harness these new opportunities that are presented by empowering youth, um, making use of uh, data, making use of technology that disseminates data and empowering a lot more a lot more uh, actors. Um, and not least, uh, we've talked about um, how, to, how we should be thinking about enhancing the climate finance architecture so that it's adequately um, tailored to respond to today's and tomorrow's most pressing climate challenges. You've heard me say this before as well. I hope you've all had a chance to visit the concentrated solar uh, power plant. Um, I heard many people that went there say how impressed they were. Um, that was one of the objectives of having the conference here, was really to give you this opportunity to see with your own eyes and experience it together. If you haven't, please do it. Tomorrow there's a few more tours. Uh, I think it's important not to miss this opportunity. As I said yesterday in the reception, um, I would like to thank the government of Morocco for being such wonderful hosts and having worked with us very closely on making this happen. The Mazen team, which was also very wonderful uh, in working with us, they, they were the ones that from day one when I proposed this to them, they said, absolutely, we are fully behind you. We will work together in making this a very successful event and providing you with this very unique opportunity uh, and really what I consider to be a really perfect platform 
to meet and inspire you all to drive new conversations on the future of climate action. I'd like to thank my team. They worked tirelessly over many months to make this happen, so thank you. You've heard me say this before, but thank you. My hope is that these last two days have, uh, will leave you re-energized and proud because I think collectively we have achieved a lot and have left you optimistic for the future. And I do hope that you take this energy back to your countries, institutions, networks, and drive further change. I said yesterday as well, for many of us like myself who have been a part of this SIFT journey for many years, uh, we've seen the power of this mechanism in driving systemic change across institution markets, even entire sectors, and I couldn't be prouder, and I'm sure I, the feeling, uh, you have the same feeling. I have to uh, recognize here, this would not have been possible without many, many, many institutions and people. First of all, our 13 donors. You present that. You, you have oh, that. it's with <laughs> me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this would not have been possible without the 72 developing countries with whom we worked, the MDBs, our implementing partners. So thank you all very much. Um, so in closing, and to my point of yesterday, it's our moment now to lead take big decisions as we did back in 2008, if for no other reason but to be able to look at our children and say I did absolutely everything I could. So thank you so much for coming, for sharing your knowledge and experiences, and for everything you have done to inspire a new generation of climate action. Thank you. Um, the case. The case also now, I should announce that there is a cake. We're actually going to have a cake <laughs> to celebrate the 10 years. It's supposed to come here somewhere. I think. <laughs> okay, something's happening. Yes. No. That's why we want you to stay here. It's a cake for you. <laughs> Hopefully. And you will all be able to taste it. In perfect order. <laughs> we have to, the three of you together with my father. It's coming? Okay. Should be a picture with you and the three, I think. I think the picture with you and the three of them. Huh? That's, ooh. So, please. This is your... Shall we ask all the ministers? Yes. Can we ask all the ministers to come up and join us here? Yeah. So, for the, the... You know, that's the, that's the advantage of being a minister. You get to taste the cake first. <laughs> so please, join us. <laughs> Wait one second. Please. Thank you. Please. Let's see. Please. Where is Zambia? Where is Zambia? There. Oh. Here it comes.
Joyeux anniversaire aussi. Yes. Can I roll his eyes? Yeah. Perfect, and here comes the rest. Now you can taste. <laughs> Ah, okay, you want to wait? Okay, one second. <laughs> want to take a picture. <laughs> I think the chef should be here, though. <laughs> Behind every cake, there is a... Yes. <laughs> We received the information that this cake will then be moved to the lobby where we had lunch. That's where you can get some cake if you want some before you leave with the bus. But uh, I'm not sure there's going to be anything left over, actually. This is the past climate finance. The big pieces come now. Even the more red. Thank you. I take off thank this. You. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Two days exactly. ongoing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 